Okay. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Good evening. Uh, we're going to begin our study here uh, uh, with a word of prayer. So if you can join me. Dear Father in heaven, we are grateful. We're grateful for the, the blessings of this past week, for the trials that we have faced, and for the way that you are working in our lives and the lives of those around us. We lift them up in prayer. You know that there's many people we care for. We see some of them hurting in various ways, sometimes because of their own choices, sometimes because of we just live in a world of sin. And we just pray, Lord, that you can use us to minister to those around us and um, that we can learn uh, of your character as we seek to cooperate with you the work of saving souls. Um, we pray, Lord, for the study this evening. We know there's truths that, um, that are often neglected in your word, often because they can cut deep. And so we pray, Lord, that our hearts can be open to reproof and correction. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, welcome everyone uh, to the study. Now, of course, we're still reading uh, study number, I think it was 24, 23, I can't remember. Um, I think it's 23. And we didn't get through all of it. Sometimes we get through some of his studies in an evening. Sometimes we don't because some of his sermons uh, tend to be longer than others. Um, now, of course, we're, we're talking about A.T. Jones. We've been reading his 1893 General Conference Bulletin sermons. And they've been very powerful. They've affected me a lot, even though I've read these a long, long time ago. And remember most of what he said. I don't think I fully understood it. And, um, and so what he's talking about here in this next part, dealing with uh, the Sunday law, I think is an extremely important part of the message of righteousness by faith, which often is neglected within Adventism. <laughs> and of course, just to remind people that Jones has made a claim in this series of studies that the mighty angel of Revelation 18 came down in 1892. And Ellen White uh, appears to be agreeing with him and what she's saying about uh, the message that was given at the 1893 General Conference. And so as we go through this, we can see that there is a parallel with our time. <clears throat> so let's continue reading here. And of course, if anybody wants to comment, there's no problem. You can stop me. Um, you can ask questions if you want. If you know someone knows the answer, we might be able to answer them. Um, and of course, I'll be asking questions just to keep you guys awake. Because I know my voice can be quite soothing. Um, that's the way I like to look at it. So anyway, let's let's begin reading. It says, now let us sketch what is in the book of Revelation after that. The third angel's message warns against the beast and his image and the danger of drinking the wine of the wrath of God, which is what he's talking about. That's after that. And then follows the coming of the Savior to reap the harvest of the earth and the people of God standing on Mount Zion. So there, that is a sketch through through from where we are to the final victory. Then the 16th chapter takes up the plagues. The 17th refers to Babylon the Great, the mother. The 18th is the message of warning, the times of refreshing, the latter rain, and the lightning of the earth, lighting of the earth with the glory of God, the calling out from Babylon because she has fallen and has become the habitation of devils as well as the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful birds, and that ye receive not of her plagues, and God hath remembered her iniquities, 
And then the word goes on and gives the actual occurrence of the judgment of God upon great, that great Babylon to her utter ruin and perdition. Then the 19th chapter, you will remember, is that song, um, that voice of a great multitude of much people in heaven saying salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God, for true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great harlot, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Hallelujah. And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of many mighty thunderings, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth, omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And the next thing he sees is heaven opened, and behold a white horse and the coming of Christ and the destruction of the nations of the earth. The beast and his image are cast together into the lake of fire, and the remnant are slain. And then the 20th chapter is the binding of Satan, the resurrection of the righteous, then the thousand years expire. And then comes the resurrection of the wicked and the judgment and the destruction of them. The 21st chapter announces the new earth and the heavenly city upon it. And the 22nd chapter, and there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servant shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light for the sun, light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Now, brethren, don't you see that from the message of Revelation 14, from the record of the third angel's message, when the image of the beast is made, that the rest of the book of Revelation is a straightforward story, as straight as can be written. From the time of the image of the, of the beast is made, and the third angel's message goes forth as it reads, as now it goes forth from this conference, as we go forth with the message, the rest of so the book of Revelation is a straightforward story to you and me right through the end of the book. Don't you see that, congregation? Yes. One event right after another, all coming in directly in connection, and those things are right before us. The rest of the book is just that, and you know that well enough. Now, I want to comment about what, what he is, is saying here. Now, in the book of Daniel, we have how many lines of prophecy? In the book of Daniel. Because he's here addressing the book of Revelation. Do we not have two lines of prophecy? Okay, well, you're going to have um, the image of Daniel chapter 2. You're going to have the, the beast of Daniel chapter 7. You're going to have... Uh, the goat and the ram um, of with the little horn of chapter uh, eight, and and then you have to decide how you treat chapter nine. Do you treat it as part of chapter eight, which I do. Uh, it's part of that same line of prophecy because it's going to the seventy weeks and the twenty three hundred days are tied together, and then you're going to have chapter ten, eleven, and twelve, and. Chapter 10, 11, and 12, like the last part of the book of Re Revelation, are pretty straightforward history. I don't disagree with that point, but are we not looking at a, a line of prophecy that, that shows us the progression of the world governments to that of the beast and then the rest that show 
the progressions for the, that for God's people. Okay, so so you're just gonna you're gonna divide uh, chapter two and seven as sort of the the kingdoms, and then chapter eight, nine, ten, eleven, and twelve as the church. Is that what you're saying? No, I'm looking at chapter eight and nine as the church, and then ten, eleven, and twelve the progression with the kingdoms because all, all this is is an enlargement of what we were seeing in Daniel 2 okay okay so so I see four in Daniel and there's part of the reason I do if you if you've seen my paper on uh, proto Daniel on Leviticus 26 so one of the things we see in Leviticus 26 is there's a progressive destruction of four right we have these four events and each of those ev events symbolize the different visions in daniel so uh, the first vision deals with the kingdoms right and the first seven times is the pride of power the second seven times is the wild beasts and that would be daniel chapter seven and then you have uh, chapter eight and nine, which are going to be addressing um, the sanctuary, um, which is going to be addressed in and and the siege of the city and so forth. That's going to be addressed in uh, Daniel chapter eight and nine. And then um, the fourth one is going to be to repeat all of all of those, right? that is in the final events that deal with uh, the destruction of the city and the sanctuary, the captivity of the people and the end of the kingdom. So all of the first three, seven times are repeated in the fourth. So the fourth is like, it's like a three, one combination in that sense. And, um, and, and those line up, I believe with Daniel 10 and 11 and 12. A part of the thing, uh, with Daniel 12, then, is what, what, I, what I see is there is a parallel between Daniel and Revelation in how the books are structured. So in Revelation, you're going to have the seven churches, the seven, uh, seven seals, and the seven trumpets, which are not going to all cover exactly the same history, because uh, the seven trumpets is going to address the fall of Rome. But but they definitely start and cover some of the same history, uh, just from a different aspect. So you've got, of course, seven churches deal with God's people. Uh, the seven seals deal with um, apostate Christianity. The seven trumpets deal with the judgments upon Rome. And then finally, you just have, from Revelation 14 onwards, this sort of straightforward um, description of events that are going to happen in the future, similar to Daniel chapter 11 and 12. Um, so does that make any sense, Dwight, what I, how, how I'm looking at it right now? You're making a good point. Yeah, but I do see what you're saying as well. So, I mean, there's different ways that we could sort of analyze the books but I, I sort of look at Daniel as um, connected to Leviticus 26. So Leviticus 26 addresses the events that are going to lead to the captivity. And the book of Daniel is prophecies that end that captivity. But it also is going to do the transition from literal Israel to spiritual Israel. And uh, so it's going to tie us into the history then. Uh, where Revelation is going to pick up and it's going to start with the church and lead us to the end time events. Um, you know, I, I think one of the things just dealing with prophecy, if you read what Jones is talking about here, now he's, he's of course going through, because um, he started here dealing with Revelation uh, 13, 
right? The, the mark of the beast and all that. And then he's going to just give us this overview of the book of Revelation. And you can see his view of Revelation is nothing like the modern scholars. It's not like reading a God Cares uh, a book two, you know, by uh, Maxwell. His, his understanding of prophecy is um, I can't think of the word. Uh, the only word I can think is what I would use, and it might sound wrong, but unsophisticated. But in a good way. I don't know if that makes sense to people. His view of prophecy I wouldn't say unsophisticated. I would say it's more ch childlike. Yeah, but that's what I mean. It's not like the scholars that we see right. today, how they would look at it. It's it's just accepting it on faith, right? He just he just accepts what God's word says. But isn't that what we're supposed to do? Yes, and that's what I'm doing. I'm comparing it with how if if he was a modern day Adventist scholar. He wouldn't address Revelation in this fashion, right? And and so there, there's there's Correct. something, yeah. So and I and I find that refreshing when I mean I love A.T. Jones. I've read all of his books, um, though I think in Ecclesiastical Empire I got lost somewhere. I don't think I finished that one, but um, uh, you know he's He's based on the word of God. Now, this is, you know, interesting point that, that we're addressing here with these um, sermons, because we know A.T. Jones believes that the mighty angel of Revelation 18 has come down. We're in that history, according to Jones, at that time. And he believes that the Sunday law is going to be happening soon, that they're basically in the time of the Sunday law. And we have this work to do. And... And there's things that we need to understand, that we need to trust God. And we need to know that God's going to perform things in a way that we can't expect or anticipate. And, and he understands the connection between the first and second angel's messages to the third angel's message. But he doesn't seem to appear to understand, from his perspective, that the first and second angel's messages have been rejected, which is why the third angel is going to be rejected. That is, even in Jones' understanding of Scripture, there are, it are things that he is missing because of the distance from Millerite history. Is, is that a fair analysis? Yes. So... So if we're thinking about Jones, he represents a type of Adventism that even if it, you know, even if Adventists talk about righteousness by faith and they read A.T. Jones, um, that there's things that Jones is missing. And, you know, and I mean, I'm a Jones and Wagner guy. That's been my whole study in my time as an Adventist pretty much. I picked up on Jones and Wagner within a very short time after becoming an Adventist. And, um, and that's what I always taught. Every single sermon I ever preached was on righteousness by faith. And sometimes I kept, you know, preaching on the same verses, verses that I would always preach on. Uh, 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 one would be Romans chapter 1. Um, but, you know, I preached on other chapters as well but it, it always have romans chapter one in there the power of god right and and of course you know present lots of things from the book of romans but i didn't i didn't understand the role of prophecy and jones did understand prophecy to a large degree if you read a.t jones most of what he writes about is prophecy history and prophecy um he doesn't mostly write, write about righteousness by faith. And, and yet he, he doesn't understand some things that, that we 
have to understand. And we were having a discussion about this in the study this afternoon. Brian came to the study, so we didn't have anybody from the building. And uh, so we went through some things that he had missed, and we were discussing um, how we're going to give a message to Adventists. What is that message going to be? And I mean, we know that it has to be about prophecy. I know it's not going to be all the stuff that we studied because that would be way too much for anybody. They'd, they'd have to take a long time to study all that material. But we've gone through an experience that should be preparing us to understand God's word and to present it to others and to learn to depend and trust upon God that he's going to do what he says. And, and that's where Jones wants to be, right? Now, he wants to give a message to the world. He doesn't understand. I mean, he knows there are Adventists who don't understand the truth, that they're just Saturday keeping, that they, they haven't experienced what it means to keep the Sabbath, and, and that they don't understand their deficiencies. But he really believes that that message is going to be going, that, that the message of righteousness by faith, the message of of the third angel's message, which includes the message of the Sabbath and the mark of the beast, he believes that that message is going to be given. And yet, just like us, he's unprepared really to do that. The church is unprepared. And we know Jones is because of his failures after uh, the third angel's message is rejected. So one is he takes it personally and, and experiences lots of discouragement about what has happened and even is bitter for a time though i believe he ends up um repenting before his death and, and recognizing where he was wrong but but where he is now in 1893 isn't very much different where we different place than where we are we think uh and especially where seven day adventists are but but we have to put ourselves here as well. We don't fully understand uh, what it is that God's going to do. And we don't have the faith that uh, God could entrust us with this work. And we just don't know it. We're glad to see it, uh, which Jones uh, admits that we have to recognize. <clears throat> so... Um, so we have all these things that he sums up. And then he says, now here's another word that we want to read from where we are. You will recognize it. Testimony, volume one, page 186. It speaks of the Laodicean message. It is designed to arouse the people of God to discover to them their backslidings and to lead to zealous repentance that they may be favored with the presence of Jesus and be fitted for the loud cry of the third angel. As this message affected the heart, it led to deep humility before God. Angels were sent in every direction to prepare unbelieving hearts for the truth. The cause of God began to rise and his, and his people were acquainted with their position. Now, let's just go back over that. Jones is going to do that too, but I just want to look at some things that, that we need to question. Take. Yeah. Uh, what, what's the page number on that PDF? Uh, well, the page number is 403. On the PDF? On the PDF. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And um, now he's quoting from the testimony volume one, page 186, which is significant because that's the number of days cardinal days from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month. That's a symbol for uh, the message of July 18th. And now this is going to speak of the Laodicean message, and you can see that this directly relates to this movement when we made the July 18, 2020 uh, proclamation, right? What this message was about. It was designed to arouse the people of God to discover to them their backslidings and to lead to zealous repentance, that they may be favored with the presence of Jesus and be fitted for the loud cry of the third angel. 
As this message affected the heart, it led to deep humility before God. Angels were sent in every direction to prepare unbelieving hearts for the truth. The cause of God began to rise and his people were acquainted with their position. So this is the work that she says is um, the message, the Laodicean message, that it's designed to arouse the people of God. Now, what is the Laodicean message? I mean, we know what it says, but what is it? How do we see it? How do we recognize it? Because we can read it in the book of Revelation. Did we receive the Laodicean message just because we read it? No. No. I would say no. So, so just like the first, second, and third angels' messages. I mean, you can read them. And, and if we understand them, then we can give those messages. But we don't just read them to people. These are, are messages that have a specific work to do, and they work their way out through history, right? They unfold. The first angel arrives. It, it, it doesn't just do its work when it arrives. It has to be proclaimed, right? It has to be formalized, and it's empowered, and then it, it causes this separation, and it, and it accomplishes a work in, in a people so that they can receive the second angel's message. And then the second angel's message does its work. And then people then can receive the third angel's message. When she speaks of the Laodicean message, have we decided what that is or what it looks like or how it unfolds in history? Right, Because we talk about the first, second, and third angel's messages, which are messages that have to do a work upon God's people. But then we have the Laodicean message. Is it part of that message? Is it a separate message? What is the Laodicean message? Uh, wouldn't it be the wouldn't it be the message that how we got there? Okay, um, but. So, I mean, we know what a message is in the Bible. A message is a series of events. It's a line. Exactly. Right. So, so there are way marks in it. Now, we can look at all the messages to the churches, and we can line them up, and we can tell you when the Laodicean message began. But is that helping us? Is there something about this Laodicean message? Because Ellen White says it is designed to arouse the people of God. Now, oh yeah, maybe un unwillingness to accept it. Okay, but the thing is, to accept it, I mean, we don't even. I mean, when we look at the first angel's message, what is the first angel's message? I mean, what is it in history? It's going to be the proclamation of this message that uh, Jesus Christ is going to come about the year eighteen forty-three. Right? That's going to be the first angel's message. Right. Now, it's interesting, you know, going back in the Millerite writings, they don't never really recognize they're giving the first angel's message until after they start giving uh, the, the, the second angel's message. That is, when they start to call the Protestants out of Babylon, and even then, Calling them out of Babylon isn't really the second angel's message. The second angel's message is Babylon is fallen, is fallen. There's actually no call out of Babylon in the second angel's message until it occurs in Revelation 18. But they attach that to it. And, and then they have some inkling that they, they gave a first message already. But they never say we're giving the first angel's message. They just seem to completely ignore it. And so after they give the second angel's message, they start to understand that they have given the second angel's message, which means they must have given the first. But they never really address the third until after 1844, after October 22nd, 1844. 
And I find this kind of interesting because, you know, Ella White goes back and says, you know, the first angel's message was given um, during the time that's the going forth of, of the virgins, you know, and then the second angel's message was fulfilled in that tarrying time. And then the third angels arrived October 22nd, 1844. Now, the Laodicean message, when does it arrive? Wouldn't that be after the third angel's message? Well, yeah. So it does come after the third angel's message. So, so the Laodicean message has a history as well. We, we will often say 1851, maybe 1852. It's in, definitely in the 1850s, as Samuel notes here. So it's going to be 18, in, in the 1850s. Now, it happens a bit gradually because uh, James White first recognizes it in regard to the first day Adventists, that is the Adventists who were part of the proclamation of the first and second angels messages that, that they're now Laodicean. So he doesn't necessarily apply it to his group of people, but I mean, he is a part of that group of people. So you could say he's applying it to himself. Um, but he doesn't quite understand it at first that this applies to the Adventists in general, including Seventh-day Adventists. This is going to develop a bit. But Ellen White will um, talk about the Laodicean message. I can't remember what the first year she does that, where she applies it to the movement that later becomes the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So she's going to apply the Laodicean message fairly early on. And she's going to apply it to the people that are part of her movement, right? Now, it is designed to arouse the people of God to discover to them their backsliding. So this message is given to a pe the people of God who are backsliding. And this message is needful in order for us to give the third angel's message. July 18th did that to some degree. Well, yeah. I mean... <laughs> Now, it could have done a better job. That is, we could have all repented. Um, yeah, come to the come to point, of, point of repentance and confession and such. Yeah, and I don't think that we're there, even the ones who, who went through that time and are still continuing to study these things. So, so this Laodicean message, if we're going to give the third angel's message, we first need to experience... The third, the, the Laodicean message. So, so often we talk about, well, the third angel's message is what we need, and it's true. But it is connected with the Laodicean message in some way. Because it, it's going to uh, arouse us, that's wake us up, uh, discover to us our backslidings, lead us to a zealous repentance. Um, so that we can be favored with the presence of Jesus. We need his presence and be fitted for the loud cry of the third angel. So in order to give the third angel's message, the Laodicean message has to do its work. And, you know, Ellen White, um, I believe it's in five testimonies where she talks about the Laodicean message. There's a, a huge section in there. I believe it's five testimonies. It could be four testimonies, but um, it's in the testimonies. And, and she talks about how, you know, Christ is knocking at the door of our heart and that we must remove the rubbish from the door to give him entrance, right? So there's this cooperation that we do with Christ uh, because we, we need to invite him in. He stands at the door and knocks. That's the Laodicean message, right? Um, but there's a work that he has to do in us a second wait a second you just passed by that really fast okay um that is the laodicean message <laughs> what do you mean that is tell me please well, explain well so we have to have christ in us now i i know these these illustrations they they sort of become worn out after a time and we you know let jesus into your heart type of things they they become meaningless after a time but the point that Ellen White is making 
is that Christ wants to have interests into our life, but we have put barriers in front of that door that he's knocking on, right? And in order for him to come in, we have a part to do in uh, removing those barriers so that he can come in and clean us up. Now, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. You know, there is a truth that we need to see. And, and we have to know how that is we see it. I mean, it's not like knowing it's going to help us particularly, but we must, we must be aware of this message. And we must seek to understand this message. And we have to know what, what work that message is going to do. So and until we until we recognize this work needs to be done, it's not going to be done. Because Jesus isn't going to do it for us unless we cooperate with him. And I would That's say right. I would say that we don't want to do this work. Adventists don't want to do this work. Yeah, we're, we're comfortable. Well, the Laodicean message is always about someone else, right? You know, if, if I can be critical of others for a moment, um, the one thing that bothers me the most about the movement is the way that we talk about other people. That we don't include ourselves. We can see the faults with, you know, the church. We can see the faults with the Catholic. We can see the faults with the world. We can see faults with our brother, right? But we're not including ourselves in that. We don't believe what God says about us, that we're Laodicean. You know, we don't see that we're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. It's we hard to accept. Yeah, because we're, we, we're rich and increased with goods, right? And have right. Needed. So, I mean, the very fact that we think we're not Laodicean is a dead giveaway that we are. Well, yeah, that's, and, that's a given right now. <laughs> the thing is we are because God says we are. That's right. It's not. So it's just a matter of believing what he says about us. Do we believe what he says? And if we believe what he says then this work will be accomplished. But, but this message also involves more than just reading about something or talking about, about something or hearing something. It is part of an experience that we must go through that I believe is a prophetic experience. So one of the things we understand about waymarks and about lines is that these are lines of judgment and the waymarks are waymarks of righteousness, according to Isaiah. 28 right so judgment will i lay to the line and righteousness to the plummet so those way marks are those horizontal are the vertical lines and the line of judgment is that horizontal line and it's illustrating our experience so there's an experience that we have to have as we trust in god as we walk with him that will reveal to us our need of him as this message affected the heart, it led to deep humility before God. Angels were sent in every direction to prepare unbelieving hearts for the truth. The cause of God began to rise and his people were acquainted with their position. So we know that this is not just something we hear about. This is about prophecy, that every message in God's word is a prophetic message. So Jones is going to go on here, and we can hear what he says about this. There is where we are. He has said, arise, hasn't he? Congregation says, yes, sir. He has brought us to the message which says to us, arise, shine, for the light is come. Well, now the time has come for us to rise. We have arisen, for he told us to, and he says so. We have arisen because we are not to forget that when he speaks the word and we yield, then the word is fulfilled. He says, arise. We say, Lord, arise it is, and then we are up. His word raises us. He says, shine. We say, Lord, shine it is, and it is so. Back there, when darkness was upon the earth, he said, let 
light be, light was. Now he says, arise. That word, when we rest upon it, raises us. He says, shine. And that word, when we yield to it, causes us to shine. His word today, which says shine, has just as much light in it as that word that said, let there be light back there. That word was light in it, has light in it. And when we yield to that word, he will see to it that we shine. But what I wanted to call your attention to especially was this promise that angels were sent in every direction to prepare unbelieving hearts for the truth. Now, the angels of God have gone forth, haven't they? They are sent. What are we going to do? When we go from this meeting, depending upon the power of God, we go with his power in his presence, with his glory upon us, waiting for him to manifest himself in his own way, in his own good time, just as he pleases. Then you can see he sending his angels ahead and then sending us on why he, is, why he sends us to meet the hearts that the angels have prepared already. Then, brethren, we have got nothing more to do any longer with getting up an interest. Don't you see that? We have nothing with getting up an interest to make a great display of getting up an interest. The interest is up. God wants us to get up to the interest, to get up to the interest, and not to get up an interest. We will do well if we get up to the interest. That is all the Lord asks of us. So Jones here is just simply saying, God has given us this promise. He's given us a message. This message gives us this power if we believe this message. And we should just trust that God is already preparing all these things. That is, people are looking at human machinery, their ideas, their methods to try to present the truth. And Jones says, we just need to believe what God has said. Um, then when he sends us to us where we are to go with that promise, it is before us, and go to meet the work that God has prepared for us on every hand in every direction. That is where we are. Is not that the way it was in the apostles' day? One reason why I wish we might have six weeks or more to study together here is that we might study the book of Acts. Then we could see how God works when he has his own way. But you can study the book of Acts yourselves. That is our lesson book now. That is the way he worked when he had poured out the early rain. And that is the lesson book to see how he will work now in the time of the latter rain. Here is an ins instance at that time, Acts 16, verse 4 and onward. And they went through the cities. They delivered them the decrees for to keep that were ordained of the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem. And so the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. Now, when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach, to preach the word in Asia, were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. And that too, when the Lord had sent them to preach the gospel to every creature. And after they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. There were men who knew what the leading of the Spirit of God is, and you and I are to know it too. Congregation, amen. And that is what the testimonies mean, and that is what the lessons of this meeting mean. Unless you are prepared to know the leading of the Spirit of God and to recognize the guidance of the Spirit of God, then don't go from this place until you do. That is what this means. Well, they could not preach the gospel in Asia anymore, and they could not go into Bithynia. And all they could do was go as far as they could in the only direction that was open. And so they came down to Troas. That was the limit. They could not preach anywhere behind them. They could not go to the right hand. And there was no, no place to the left. And there they were at the edge of the sea where they were. What then? Then the Lord told them what to do. And they passing by Mysia came down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. And there stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately he endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had, has called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Therefore, loosing from Troas, we came with a straight course 
to Samothracia, and the next day to Neapolis, and from the, thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia, and a colony. And we were in that city abiding certain days. And on the Sabbath, we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made. And we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted thither, and a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple, of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. Why did the Lord want them to go over into Macedonia? To meet the interest which the angel of the Lord had already opened. Cornelius, too, was seeking the Lord. An angel appeared to him and told him to send for Peter, who would tell him words, whereby he should be saved. Peter went. But it was only to meet the interest that had already been raised. Philip, too, was sent away across the country to find the eunuch and meet the interest that was already raised in his mind and heart. And that is enough on that point. You can see by this that the book of Acts, from this day forward, is your lesson book and mine on the work of God, how he will carry on the work and what place he wants us to occupy. And brethren, bear in mind that what he says is so all the way through. Now let us turn to Isaiah and read a passage as to what the Lord wants us to do and what he has for us. You remember that I referred to the 60th chapter of Isaiah, and we will now read the last two verses. Thy people shall be all righteous. They shall inherit the land forever. The branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I may be glorified. A little one shall become a thousand, and a small one a strong nation. I, the Lord, will hasten it in his time. Then the 61st, 60, 61st chapter, uh, I don't think, I don't know, the 61. Okay, the 61st chapter, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and the day of the vengeance of our God, and to comfort all that mourn. Now the last two verses of that same chapter, and then the 62nd chapter. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation, and he hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. For as the earth bringeth forth her bud, and as the garden causeth the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. That is what he is going to do now. For Zion's sake, I will not hold my peace. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest. What do you say? Afraid of getting tired? Are you? Oh, yes, I have been at work quite a while now, and I think I had better go home and rest. You had better stay where you are and rest. Stay there and work while you rest. For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace. And for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth. Brethren, I want to tell you that if you will keep up the health reform and live it out according to God's idea, you will not have to rest. You will work while you rest and you will need no vacation at all. I know it from experience. You know as well as I do that for the last three years, I've been working all the time and I've had no vacation. I've not needed it. I do not want it. I've gone through institutes and camp meetings right out of one into another without any rest and have gained in weight and strength all the time. And I shall go out of this general conference where I've been working every minute of the time from early morning until sometimes midnight, just as fresh as I was when I started into the conference. And I expect to say, stay so. But you must learn to work on your vittles instead of on your vitals. A man cannot keep this up and work on his vitals. But he can work on his vittles and do it year in and year out. You get the health reform as it is and can do this as he said. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest. I'm bold to talk on this sub subject of health reform because I think I'm a pretty good specimen. Well, says one, you have a good, strong digestion. 
no, sir, I have a weak stomach and I have had for years. And I have, ha I have to be careful with my stomach all the time that it does not get all undone. If that is what health reform is for, to give a man sense enough to take care of himself. So then, let us stick to that. For Jer Zion's sake will I not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest, until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness, and the salvation thereof is a lamp that burneth. And the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness, and all the kings thy glory, and thou shalt be called a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. Thou also, thou shalt also be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord, and royal diadem in the hand of thy God. Thou shalt no more be termed forsaken, neither shall thy land any more be termed desolate, but thou shalt be called Hephziba, and thy land Beulah. For the Lord delighteth in thee, and thy land shall be merry. For as a young man marrieth a virgin, so shall thy sons marry thee. And as the bridegroom rejoiceth over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. I have set watchmen upon thy walls, O Jerusalem, which shall never hold their peace day nor night. Ye that make mention of the Lord, keep not silence and give him no rest. Well, when we work without rest and give him no rest either, I tell you, there's something going to be done. And I give him no rest till he establish and make Jerusalem a praise in the earth. The Lord has sworn by the arm of his right hand and by the arm of his strength. Surely I will no more give thy corn to be meat for thine enemies and the sons of the stranger shall not drink thy wine. For the which thou hast labored, but that have gathered it shall eat it. They that have gathered it shall eat it and praise the Lord. And they that have brought it together shall drink it in the courts of my holiness. Go through, go through the gates, prepare ye the way of the people. Cast up, cast up the highway, gather out the stones, lift up a standard for the people. Behold, the Lord hath proclaimed unto the end of the world, say, unto, say ye to the daughter of Zion. This is our message. Behold, thy salvation cometh. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. And they shall call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord, and thou shalt be called sought out a city not forsaken. Who is this, this that cometh from Edom with thy garments from Basra? This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength? Who is this? I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. That is the coming of the Lord, the 63rd, 64th, and 65th chapters of Isaiah. Speak of the new heavens and the new earth. And the 66th declares that as these remain, so shall we remain. And from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me, said the Lord. Don't you see that Isaiah, from the 60th to the 66th chapters, is a parallel to Revelation 13 and on to the end of the book? All these things the Lord uses to show us what he is going to do now. Well, brethren, the Bible is full of it. The Bible is full of it. Let us believe it. Let us believe him and the message that he has given us and the power of the message which he has given to everyone. And may none go from this conference without it. <clears throat> okay. Now, we're, we're not going to go into his 24th message, uh, number 24, but we are going to discuss some of what we just read. Now, When we think about, um, I mean, I know all of us have probably experienced the Lord's leading, uh, going where we're called. Now, uh, I put this. So why, why does the church, why do we not operate in this way all the time as the apostles did? What's wrong with us? Because we've been so influenced by the method in which 
the church has operated, that we've naturally fallen into that same pattern. Yeah, and I mean, even in my own experience, I mean, I, I, I stumble, maybe that's not the right word, but I stumble at the, the problems that are put in my way. Um, you know, when we look at, at what this, what we're supposed to do, so often I have these ideas, and, and this is the way that I make decisions, is it, it kind of seems like maybe to some people a bit foolish, but um, I often have ideas of things that I think could be done, but I don't do things without God's leading. And and yet, you know, I, I sort of beat myself up a little bit about it because I'm I've al always uncertain. Am I just following my own inclination or am I following God? That is, we would all like to have something clearly spoken to us of what we should do. Right. A voice from heaven. Something like that. But how does how does God lead us? So how, how does God lead us? I, I, I'm not exactly sure if this qualifies, but um, so I've heard at my time, a lot of times when I'm making decisions, I make a decision and oftentimes it's wrong because something comes in my way and prevents me from doing that, what I wanted to do. And I'm forced to do something else. Okay. A lot of times. But I give, I, uh, you know, I, I never asked anybody anything but myself up before a certain time. Um, not so much now, but before it was, it was, it was, you know, I'm just, I'm going to do this because. Well, let's not worry time. about before. Let's just say right now, if we're going to follow God, we're going to make decisions, you know. Like I'm having a camp meeting this summer. Um, so, you know, how do I make that decision? Well, some people, what they do is they do what I call presumption. That is, first off, is we don't start with making decisions. Where do we start? Uh, prayer and asking. Okay, well, even before that. I mean, well, prayer is always there, but it's studying God's word. Yes, sir. Okay. So, and, and then it's also obeying God's word. Because God, yes, God can't lead us if we're disobedient to what, to his word. Right? Right. You know, um, we know that we have God's word guiding our feet. We can't walk down the path where God wants us to go if we're not following the light that's in front of us. You know, the path of the just is as a shining light that shineth more and more into a perfect day. And and people often want to have God make decisions for them, but they're not even connected with God. So you can have people who would take what Jones has said, and I've seen these people, they, they go about imagining that they're led by God, but they're just led by their own impulses, right? Because they're not studying God's word. They're not depending upon him. They're not obeying the things that they know that they need to obey. And so Jones isn't saying we just, you know, go out and do whatever comes into mind. And just trust that God's leading us blindly because that wasn't Paul's situation. Paul was committed to the truth. And if we're committed to the truth, we can trust that God is going to accomplish what his word says he's going to accomplish. And that has nothing really to do with us. So we're not waiting for a voice from heaven, though they may come. What we're doing is we're following God.
And any thoughts on that? So, um, after our study in Judges, are we going to Acts? I have no idea. Probably not. I mean, I think we're, we're going from the Bible right through. But what we've been given to do, right? At least what I've been given to do is to study. Right? That's what we're doing. We're studying God's word. We're digging That's what into we've determined. Word. We've determined. And, and even though I have all of these things that I would want to do, the only thing I'm compelled to do is to study God's word. As well I. And, and when you study God's word, then you have a message to give, right? Then you can share it with others. So we seek always opportunities to share God's word wherever it is, right? So in the building that we're in, we have Bible studies on Friday afternoon. But today we just had, you know, a person who's in this message was there. So the picture you sent on the, uh, in your email this afternoon. Yeah. Is, is that where you're at? Yeah. Nice. Well, it's kind of, you know, it's in a city technically, but it is a pretty rural city. You want to call a city rural. I know to people in Africa, I show them pictures and they say, you live in the country. You know, depends where they live in Africa. Um, depends where they live in the world, because some places are pretty country, but you know, the idea that there's so many trees definitely doesn't seem to them like a city. But anyway, um, <clears throat> but anyway, so so getting back to this point, we we want to share wherever God is going to lead us, and and God leads us where we don't want to go most of the time. So I mean, you bring up the building here, you know, like I brought it up, I guess. But um, you know, I didn't want to be here. But this is where God put us. And there, there was somewhat of my, my explanation or trying to relate to what you were saying earlier. It's, yeah. I get it. Yeah. So, and, and, and mostly it's for us in the sense that there are things that we have to learn, skills we have to develop. Me, it, those are social skills, which I still don't have many of. Not great social skills. I keep working on it. Um, but, you know, having to deal with people every day um, is a good thing for me um, in a different situation than in a guitar store or teaching, because that's not really a social skill. That's, uh, that's a different type of skill. But having to deal with people socially, having to talk to them, it's pretty painful uh, for me. Yeah, so he right. sticks you in a big building full of them. <laughs> yeah. Right? Oh, it's it's great for Heidi though, and she loves people. But, and I do too. It's just having to deal with people on a social level. It's not something I like to do. So, so I have to learn that. Um. So anyway, we're gonna. Any any more thoughts? Just hang on. Any more thoughts about this? Especially about, um the role of prophecy in the Laodicean message. I do recall any... Jeff saying, yeah, I, excuse me, Theodore, I do recall Jeff saying that it's our duty to study the prophecies. Yeah. It's something that we can ease ourselves out of. We're called to do it. We're commanded to do it. There's no doubt about that. Sec, trying to find something. As we study these prophecies, you know, we we continue to to understand what what it is that we are um, coming to because we're beginning to understand the lines better. 
the repetition in history. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so this is not the quote I'm looking for, but this one's good. Um, okay, so this is January 1st, 1889. Uh, this is from the Review and Herald. Let me go here. <clears throat> um, it's entitled The Present Crisis. And um, of course, this is in the midst of that whole 1888 controversy. So Ellen White says, we feel deeply over the present state of the church, whose members have long possessed a knowledge of the, those events which are to transpire near the close of time in fulfillment of prophetic history. So that would be us, right? Yeah. Christ is coming in power and great glory, and the dead are to be judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. The one who has stood as our intercessor, who hears all penitential prayers and confessions, who is represented with a rainbow, the symbol of grace and love encircling his head. So which vision is this that she's referring to? Who's, who is this? What vision? Okay, it's Revelation chapter 4, right? Christ is the one with the rainbow above his head, seated upon the throne. Ellen White's going to, you could, we could do a study on it. I'm not going to do that right now. But we can show that the one seated upon the throne in Revelation 4, who can't open the book, is the same one who opens the book when he's portrayed as a lamb with seven heads and seven eyes. Or not, what is it? Seven. How, how's that go? <clears throat> seven horns and seven eyes, pardon me. Right, Revelation chapter five is where that, that lamb opens the book. Um. The lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, not seven heads, um, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. So we can see that Christ seated upon the throne can't open up the book. But this lamb that has seven horns and seven eyes can that had been slain. Right. So she's referring to this one seated upon this throne. That's Christ. He has the rainbow above his head. Okay, I'm just going to make this a little bit bigger. Um, grace and mercy will then descend from the throne and justice will take their place. For he whom his people have looked, um, I lost my spot there. For he, he for whom his people have looked will assume his right, the office of supreme judge. The Father hath committed all judgment unto the Son, and he hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. It was he, says Peter, who was ordained to judge the quick and the dead. He hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness, and by that man whom he hath ordained. The faith and patience of those who have waited long have been sorely tried. Hope deferred has has made the heart sick, and the cry has come up before God, Lord, how long? By now the signs are fulfilling, nation rising against nation, startling calamities by land and by sea, famine, pestilence, fearful storms, sweeping floods, and great conflagrations. All these, 
testify that we are approaching the grand consummation. The cry going up to God from the waiting ones will not be in vain. The response will come. It is done. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Can the church contemplate this hour with calm indifference? The crisis is now upon us. The battle is to be waged between Christianity of the Bible and the Christianity of human tradition. Is there not, not a criminal neglect in our present sleepy condition? There must be a decided advanced movement among us. We must show to the world that we recognize in the events that are now taking place in connection with the national reform movement, the fulfillment of prophecy, that which we have for the last 30 or 40 years proclaimed would come is now here. And the trumpet of every watchman upon the walls of Zion should raise the alarm. So she's referring to what? This national reform movement. This is dealing with uh, the Blair Bill and the Sunday Law in 1888, correct? Yeah, that would be the timing. Yeah, and Jones refers to that in his 1893 General Conference Bulletin because he said we had that in 1888 and now we have um, this situation with, um, uh, you know, the, the Chicago World's Fair, right? What, what was happening there? So... Um, so we can see that this crisis is, is now upon us, right? That we're in it, the history of the Sunday law, just as they were there. Prophecy repre uh, pre represents Protestantism as having lamb-like horns, but speaking like a dragon. Already, we are beginning to hear the voice of the dragon. There is a satanic force propelling the Sunday movement, but it is concealed. Even the men who are engaged in the work are themselves blinded to the results which will follow their movement. Let not the commandment keeping people of God be silent at this time, as though we gracefully accepted the situation. There is the prospect before us of waging a continuous war at the risk of imprisonment, of losing property, and even life itself to defend the law of God, which is being made void by the laws of men. The Bible text will be quoted to us. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. The powers that be are ordained of God. When the disciples preached Christ and him crucified after his resurrection, the authorities commanded them not to speak any more, nor to teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, whether it be right in the sight of God, to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things we have seen and heard. They continued to preach Jesus and him crucified and afterward raised from the dead. The sick were healed the th and thousands were added to the church. Then the high priest rose up and all that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation and laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. But the God of heaven, the mighty ruler of the universe, took this matter into his own hands. For men were warring against his work. He showed them plainly that there is a ruler above man whose authority must be respected. The Lord sent his angel by night to open the prison doors, and he brought forth these men whom God had commissioned to do his work. Thus we see that these rulers were not in harmony with God's word. Had they taken him into their counsel, they would not have commanded the disciples to do contrary to his will. The ruler said, speak not at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But the heavenly messenger sent by God said, go, stand and speak in the temple to the people, all the words of this life. Those who shall seek to compel men to observe an institution of the papacy and trample upon God's authority are doing a work similar to that of the scribes, Pharisees, and Sadducees in the days of the apostles. When the laws of earthly rulers are brought into opposition to the laws of the supreme ruler of the universe, then those who are God's loyal subjects will be true to him. The national reform movement that the world and the church have linked hands to bring about will manifest the same oppression 
haughtiness, arrogance, and intolerance, which have prevailed in past ages. The powers of human councils then assumed the prerogatives of deity, crushing under the despotic will, liberty of conscience, and the right of individual responsibility. And imprisonment, exile, and death followed for all who opposed their dictates. Many will plead, there's no prospect that popery will ever be revived. Now, this is an interesting point in Ellen White's day because um, the idea that the Catholic Church would once again uh, become favored uh, just seemed preposterous to uh, people living in the United States at that time. Um, if it shall reign, regain its lost ascendancy, it will be by Protestants Protestantism giving it the right hand of fellowship, right? So this is a concession on the part of the Protestants that will make, uh, cause the papacy to be revived. If it shall be legislated into power by the concessions of time-serving men, the fires of persecution will be rekindled against those who will not sacrifice conscience and the truth for the heirs of the papacy. Once let the minds of the Christian world be turned away from God. Let his law be dishonored and his holy day trampled upon. And they will be ready to take any step where Satan may lead the way. Some urge that the Catholic religion is not what it once was, but we've heard that before. That the principles to which Protestants could not concede and, the, and indignantly rose up to war against were held by Catholics in the days of their ignorance and barbarism. They say that the present high mental development of the people would never allow them to adopt the plan of action carried out in the past, compelling the, uh, compelling the conscience upon religious subjects. But there's nothing in the scriptures to assure us against the reinstatement of popery. Protestants today are self-sufficient, world-loving people, but they must have some religion and prefer that consisting of forms and outward display rather than the simplicity of the true religion of Jesus Christ. They are too wise in their own conceit to seek, seek God for counsel and direction, to open the guidebook which points them to the only way that leads to heaven. They close their hearts to Jesus in his humiliation, self-denial, and self-sacrifice, and open the door to the delusions of Satan. While the Protestant world is, by her attitude, making concessions to Rome, we should arouse to comprehend the situation and view the contest before us um, in its true bearings. While men have slept, Satan has been stealthily sowing the tares. Let the watchmen now lift up their voice like a trumpet and give the message which is present truth for this time. Let them know where we are in prophetic history that the spirit of true Protestantism may awaken all the world to a sense of the value of the privileges of religious liberty so long enjoyed. So this, the, we can see here that knowing where we are in prophetic history, is it important as part of our message? Yes. This nation has been highly favored of God. Um, it has been the great center of religious light and liberty. Oh, do not sleep now, and in your activity feel that you are doing the will of God. The experience of God's commandment-keeping people now should correspond with the events that are crowding upon us. It should be the business of all the righteous in the land, as they see signs of the approach of peril, to arouse to action and not sit in calm expectation of ruin comforting themselves with the belief that this work must go on because prophecy has foretold it and that the Lord will shelter his people in the day of trial. Effectual, fervent prayers should be ascending to heaven that this calamity may be deferred, for we are not ready to meet it. Every passing hour now is one of activity in the heavenly courts to make ready a people upon the earth to act a part in the great scenes that are soon to open upon us. These transient moments that seem of so little value to us are weighty with eternal interests. They are molding the destiny of souls for everlasting life or everlasting death. The words we utter today in the ears of the people, 
the works we are doing, the spirit of the message we are bearing, will be to human souls the savor of life unto life or of death unto death. We must be washing our robes of character in the blood of the Lamb. If we would be saints above, we must be must first be saints below. We were talking about this before the study about the influence that we have. We have lost much time in inaction because we have not realized the time in which we are living. This we deplore and would humble our souls before God, pleading with him for pardon, for sleeping at our post of duty and allowing the enemy to gain the advantage over us. Many have chosen to do nothing when they should have been diligent to repulse the enemy. Let your services now be dedicated to God. Gird on the armor for vigorous work saying, here I am, Lord, send me. It is essential that we be much in prayer to God, that his voice and his power may be manifested in behalf of his people, and that the angels may hold the four winds until the truth is more fully proclaimed, and the servants of God are sealed in their foreheads. God is not pleased with the attitude of his people. Satan is taking the world captive. And the sentinels for God and the truth are letting him do it. Watch then. Stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men. Be strong. Arouse and come to the front. Be staunch to defend your religious liberty. Many of our people are registered in the book of heaven as slothful servants. I'm just going to skip that chapter or chapter paragraph. Um, she says, we are not ready for this great issue to which the enforcement of the Sunday law will bring us. So we need to recognize this. We are not ready for this great issue. One is we haven't done our work. But we ourselves are not ready. Let the members of our churches become missionaries for the master. Let them not linger in ease and indifference, but let them go forth to work for God. Their spiritual muscles have been nearly palsied with inaction. Go with the camp, bearing, go without the camp, bearing the reproach of Christ and the truth. Work today in the Lord's vineyard. Go out into the highways and hedges and stir up the people to investigate the truth. Woe to all who profess to walk in the light, yet who are at ease in Zion. They absorb the God given rays of righteousness, but do not diffuse the light to others the parable of the faithless servant who hid his lord's money condemns them so obviously this is a message that's um, hard to take now this is the part i want to read here every true child of god should now be inquiring what wouldst thou have me to do brethren for christ's sake do something and do it now Satanic influences are all around us to be met and resisted. And, and this is what Jones is saying, right? That's why I, I laugh there. Just she's saying it in a different way, more, more direct, actually. We know that satanic influences are all around us to be met and resisted, right? The tares are mingled with the wheat, error with truth, coldness with zeal, darkness with light. There must be a returning to our first love. We must battle nobly with tribulation and danger in the midst of trials, tests, and provings of God. We must be rich in faith and good works. The message to the Laodicean church is applicable to those who have been made the repository of great truth. Have we been made the repository of great truth? Yes. Then the message to the Laodicean church is applicable to us. The church yes. is distinguished in prophecy by its great profession of advanced light. Yet it was filled with spiritual pride and lukewarmness in religion. They had a religious theory, but were greatly lacking in moral power and holiness. And that's us. They are pronounced wretched, poor, blind, and naked. Oh, that our people would realize the danger and heed the counsel of the true witness. Buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment thou mayest, mayest be clothed. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. 
Will we now, who have had such great light, make some sacrifice for Jesus, who for our sakes became poor, that we through his poverty might be made rich? We must arouse and through piety and earnest work for the master, partake of his spirit of love for souls, of faith in God, that he may work with us, by us, and through us. So we can see the tie here that Jones has in his presentation between the Sunday law and what's coming and the message to the Laodiceans and the preparation that we have to uh, make in order to be ready for that time. <clears throat> well, thanks, everyone. And any final comments before we close with prayer? So Dwight has a presentation tomorrow morning at 7.30 Mountain uh, Daylight Time. And um, I'm not going to be there for, I know that Colin's presenting uh, in the morning, but I'm going to be in Warburg because Heidi's going to be doing special music. And uh, so we all need prayers uh, in, in our ministry there. And... Um, um, and then we have our studies again Sunday morning and Sunday afternoon this week. So anyway, any, any final thoughts? If not, I can close with prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study this evening, for the things that you, you teach us, and for each person searching for truth. Lord, we pray that the message of prophecy of Christ's righteousness. We can see that they are one and the same message and that they're meant to arouse us, to show us our true spiritual condition. We ask, Lord, that um, this Sabbath can be a blessing, that we can know your presence and that the conviction and power that comes from your word can strengthen us. We can see what we need to do each day, each moment. Help us to trust in you. And thank you, Lord, for the time that we had here this evening. Continue to be with us in our studies together. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.